On June 12th, 2008, around 1 o'clock p.m., I made a note in my prison journal that hangs behind me in my office, and I wrote that taxpayers would probably be upset if they knew the way that I was serving time in prison. And I'd been in about six or seven weeks at the time. It was a productive experience thus far. Certainly nothing like uh, prison was nothing like I had seen sensationalized on television. So I was pleasantly surprised, as crazy as that may sound to some. Well, what about Elizabeth Holmes? Elizabeth Holmes is going to get sentenced this September. I think she'll get sentenced to five years with good planning. She could be out in 18 months or so. I know many of you have said you still don't think she's going to go to prison, even though she's been convicted. Totally disagree. She's going for a while. And if she's there, will she have a productive experience like me? Or will she spend her days lamenting, blaming the judge, Balwani, you, me, everyone else for her plight in life? plight in life. The choice is hers. In this video, I am going to discuss Elizabeth Holmes' life in federal prison. Before I do some caveats, I did not create America's prison system. It existed long before I surrendered to federal prison for 18 months in April 2008. I share this because some of you may get upset or off-put if you knew what was possible in prison, if you knew the way that some prisoners serve time, both good and bad, right? You may be upset to know that some prisoners can lay out for eight hours a day or play bocce ball or soccer or tennis or run for eight or nine hours a day. It can be very frustrating. It's the reason so many people call minimum security camps or federal prison camps a country club. Some people, of course, um, have miserable experiences and choose to make it a horrific experience. But I share this with you because don't shoot the messenger. If you're going to be in prison, you might as well make the most of it. Those are my thoughts too. Second caveat, white collar advice prepares primarily white collar defendants for sentencing and prison. The majority of our clients go to minimum security camps or low security prisons. I mention this because while of course we cover federal prison and everyone on our team has served time in prison, including my partner, Michael Santos, who did 26 consecutive years, including eight years in the penitentiary, while we all serve time in all security levels, we do not glorify or sensationalize prison. We don't talk about how ramen noodle can become a weapon. We don't discuss how guards can prostitute out their female guard. Yeah. All these crazy things. It's funny. It's sensationalized on other YouTube channels. It's done really well in Michael's book, Inside Life Behind Bars in America's that you should read. But the majority of our clients are white collar defendants, like an Elizabeth Holmes or Sonny Belwani or me or stockbrokers or many of the parents in the Varsity Blues case were our clients. Just want to get that caveat out of the way. Before I continue, a quick thank you. I'm so grateful for your engagement in our Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani series. I know you're you're busy and thing, many things are competing for your attention. And sometimes when you go online, you may go in a different direction. I did that earlier today. I went to do some research. 27 minutes later, I was still looking at golf tips on YouTube. So I'm grateful that you're here. Please like and subscribe and provide feedback. We always want to do as best as we possibly can. In a previous video, I addressed Elizabeth Holmes' first day in federal prison. And because I respect your time, and I already filmed the video, I won't do it again. I will put a link to that video in the YouTube description. I'll do a quick summary. The day of her surrender is a little bit of shock and awe, like, my God, how did I end up here? I'm about to surrender to federal prison against my will. But also, the good is, at least she begins to get credit for time served, because the majority of defendants waiting to go in already feel like they're in prison. I'm just not getting credit. I would encourage her to surrender with money, with any medications, with her vaccination card, because if she doesn't, and this may please some of you looking to see her, who want her to suffer in prison and really have a horrific experience, she may quarantine for 23 hours a day. And she may be only able to go out once or twice a week to shower and exercise. So life in quarantine is very difficult. So she should bring the vaccination card with hope she may not quarantine or for as long. She may bring clothes, although there ain't no chance she's getting in with them. The guards are going to take the clothes or she can send them home at her expense. After she makes her way into the high security prison, which I believe to be Dublin Federal Prison Camp in Northern California, there is a chance she can get shipped all the way across country to Alderson in West Virginia and have to transfer and work her way back. I'm not psychic, I don't know, but I suspect it will be Dublin. And eventually, after about six hours or so, she will go from the high security 
uh, prison at Dublin to the minimum security camp. During the intake process, they may ask her again about the medications, religious affiliations, any health issues. If she'd be willing to cooperate with staff, the answer should be no. They'll ask her for a phone number or contact information in case something happens. Now, every now and again, this freaks out some prisoners like, wait a second, I'm going to a camp. I thought this is a white collar country club. How could something happen to me? Why are you asking for information? They're just required to ask, it's, it's what they do. After this several hour process of getting asked questions, they will drive her over to the minimum security camp. And when she gets out of the camp, in many ways it will look like a corporate office park or a junior college. She's gonna see a, a chow hall, camp control, where visitation takes place. She's gonna see a big dorm that houses all of the prisoners, a lot of walking areas, a lot of grass, a lot of dirt. She's gonna see a big track, she'll see a bocce ball, court, a volleyball court, tennis court, softball field, soccer field, ample opportunity to exercise in federal prison. So when you see it, because the camp doesn't have barbed wire, like the low security prison across the street will, it's a very unassuming environment. In fact, the only thing that says you can't leave is a sign in the ground that says out of bounds, do not go. So that will soothe her a bit that it's not like she saw on television. In this country, we are enamored by uh, celebrities. For that reason, some prisoners will kind of kowtow to her in predictable fashion. I know you, I'm sorry you're here. How can I help? This place is fine, no problem. Here's granola, here's a cupcake, here's Diet Coke, whatever it may be. Elizabeth Holmes will have to decide if she wants to take that, if she wants to take that, if she, in time she may have to reciprocate. Most people do have good intentions. So while some people will suck up to her, others won't know who the hell she is and won't care, of course. Others will be off put by her. They're gonna feel she's privileged, entitled, went to trial, lost, got a shorter sentences than many people who are in prison for nonviolent drug crimes. So some people may challenge her or call her out. So in those early days, it's essential for Elizabeth Holmes while living in federal prison to be deferential, to be humble. The last thing she should care about is her reputation. Her goal is to avoid disciplinary infractions, avoid transfers, avoid going to the hole where you come out looking like a ghost after three months because you're locked in a cage or a bunker. She's got to recognize what is her highest value and that should be getting home to her family strong and, and safe, not defending herself in prison because she's concerned about her prison rep. That's utterly absurd. After she gets to the camp, a guard and for some prison parlance, we call we didn't call correctional officers correctional officers because during the 388 days that I served in prison, I didn't see any correcting. I did see a lot of guarding. On the flip side, they call us prisoners. Excuse me, we prefer to be called prisoners or people. They call us inmates. It's the way it goes. It's a game of give and take. Once she gets to the camp, a guard will direct her to laundry where she'll get a mattress. It's like this. It's like as thick as the size of my book, Lessons from Prison. Shameless plug. You can get my book for free at White Collar Vice. Mattress is like this thin. It's like, wow, you almost think it's a joke. But it's actually not a joke. It's the real thing. She's in prison. Wow. So the mattress is about that big. The sheets, she'll get a towel. Let me give you, I usually don't do props in videos, but you're worth it. When I got to prison, they gave me a towel and I'm like, oh, this is a nice hand towel. And the, my bunkie was like, no, dude, that's your towel. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, this is a hand towel, it's really small. He's like, no, this is your towel. I'm like, is, is this some sort of joke? He's like, no, this is the towel, get used to it. You can eventually buy a bigger one in the commissary. And that took about two weeks. So. She's gonna be given a number of these things. Some of them may shock her like the towel on the mattress. And what she has to do in those early days in federal prison is fixate on what she can and cannot control. May not be able to control her initial bunkie or towel, even her job perhaps, but she can control her attitude as she walks in to that dorm. And I'm gonna get into all of these things as I discuss her life in federal prison. Before I do a couple of other thoughts, there are prisoners from the get-go who will tell her what they told me, which is, just serve your sentence, forget about the outside world. In fact, when I was in prison, a prisoner said to me, you really only serve two days in prison, the first day and the last day, everything in between, you're just living, you just happen to be in jail. So there are a number of prisoners who will tell her to forget about the outside world. Of course, our team totally disagrees with that because the hardest part at times can be coming home with a sullied reputation and she should recognize in those early days, as tough as it may be, she still has it better than most. She has resources, she has a family, she has a network, she has fame, both good and bad, that accompanies that. And she should recognize that the majority of the, the women, good women around her, have not had the opportunities that, that she squandered. So rather than complain and lament, she should find 
gratitude and deference and recognize that most people have it harder than her. And if she can do that, she'll get through that first night better to that first night. You don't really sleep that first night in prison because it's loud. It's a lot of lights in and around you. You're, she will be in the front of the dorm as most prisoners are in the front of the dorm in an upper bunk, very tight little metal slab getting up there. I slipped twice, very dangerous getting up there. You also don't sleep well because you have guards that are walking around the night doing what's called the census count, 10 p.m., 1 a.m., 3 a.m., 5 a.m. You're counted many times in federal prison. So for that reason, she's not going to sleep well, especially with guards literally putting flashlights in your eyes. I would encourage her to wake early around 5 a.m. because it's nice to have some peace and quiet while the dorm is sleeping. Go to the quiet room and think and reflect and, and plan out Plan out the day. A benefit of waking early is you go to bed earlier because a lot of the hustle, the disciplinary infractions, the gambling, the problems, the drinking, the drugs, the iPhones, all of these things are pervasive in a minimum security camp. They're brought in both by guards. I think a guard in a week in America is arrested. By guards, by people who visit, people who are literally bringing drones and dropping bags of food onto the yard. So a lot of the trouble happens in the evening. So the earlier she wakes, the earlier she'll go to bed further. There's value in having some like privacy and using the, the restroom without getting too graphic. Come seven or eight o'clock in the morning, there'll be 30 women in line standing there with a roll of toilet paper. And that's when you tell yourself, like I once told myself, damn, I really feel like I'm in jail here. I got to get my act together, wake up earlier and plan my day. Now, once she gets up at 5 a.m. or whenever she gets up, I'd encourage her to go to the chow hall. Probably opens around 6.30 or so in the morning. Lunch will be at 11. Dinner around 4 or 5 o'clock. They serve it pretty early. The food is kind of what you can expect. Pastries, some old fruit, milk, coffee, some, some pancakes, oatmeal, cereal. It, it's nothing that, that's so overwhelming. But... There's value in getting the day started and having a healthy meal. You could argue she walks down to the chow hall. She shouldn't. She should not cut in line. You will find even in a minimum, minimum security camp in the chow hall, you're going to see races sitting together. I recall when I was in federal prison, Hispanics sat together, African-Americans sat together, Asians sat together. There are times where many people will be standing waiting to, to be seated, even though there are open seats. It just happens that open seat is an area where you are not you are not welcome. Guards are sort of deferential to that. They understand it. Uh, they don't push it. So I would encourage her to, to recognize that, to be aware of it rather than just being so aloof and dumb and thinking, oh, I see an open seat. Uh, I'm going to take it. It's crucial that she's always aware of her surroundings. And even if people aren't speaking to her, they are assessing her. They are watching her. They want to know if she's keeping her bunk clean, if her, if her, if her room is neat and clean. Because eventually, while she's in the front of the dorm in a really kind of terrible bunk, what is she going to want? What, what everyone wants. You want to move up. You want to move to a better location. Her goal will be to adjust well, to be hygienic, to, uh, to adjust properly, where in time someone may say, would you like to move into my bunk? That happened to me. I was clean. I was polite. I woke early. I wasn't loud. I wasn't rude. I didn't change clothes in my cubicle like so many people do. You're supposed to take your clothes. Elizabeth Holmes needs to take her clothes, walk down to a shower stall, and change rather than getting naked inside of the, the cubicle. So there's an etiquette and rules that she needs to embrace and understand beyond not complaining. If she adjusts well, people will want to associate with her and they'll respect the fact that she is sort of biding her time and not making matters worse and being critical and rude and mean to others around her because she may think she's better than them because in her eyes, she's not a criminal. I'm a criminal. Many of the women they heard played guilty are a criminal. She's not a criminal after all. She pled guilty and she went to trial. Now, one of the first things that most prisoners do, including me, after they hit the compound is go to the bathrooms. They want to see the bathrooms. They want to see the showers. They want to know if it's clean. Is it open? So in the next part of this video, Elizabeth Holmes Life in Federal Prison, I'm going to refer to a blog that our team wrote at whitecollarvice.com and get into some of the unwritten rules of the bathroom. So despite the fact that I mentioned earlier in this video that the prison looks like a junior college, didn't change the fact that I was scared to death about what the bathrooms were going to, to look like. I had just built up in my mind they were going to be filthy and dirty and just no privacy. Absolutely awful. So to help go through some of the unwritten rules of living in prison, specifically using the bathroom, I'm going to refer to a blog 
that our team wrote. We wrote, there is a bathroom protocol that all new prisoners Elizabeth Holmes needs to understand. With the, with the total absence of privacy for people in prison, people will find that their peers accept them more easily if they make a commitment to adhere to the following basic unwritten rules of living in prison. One, wait your turn before showering. Do not look at others when showering. Seems pretty obvious. If, if a custom exists for people not to use some showers in order to offer an illusion of privacy in other showers, respect that custom. Now that's a mistake that I made. So like if there's two rows of showers, seven showers and seven showers, you may see like six open showers on the left side. And it's like common sense to say, I need to take a shower. I'm going to walk into the, uh, to one of these open showers, but you're not supposed to shower across from anyone. It's the reason that like eight or nine people are standing in line to use the shower, despite a whole row of showers being open. So you, she should respect that and understand that. And I didn't know that. And while I wasn't like castigated or didn't have any trouble, a couple of long-term prisoners basically said, Hey man, do you realize like there's a reason there's a line here despite some open showers, get it together. Lastly, in the bathroom, you want to be clean after using the shower, bathroom or sink, wash your hands. If you brush your teeth and you leave it as a mess, you are going to get called out. You're going to get embarrassed. There are people that will threaten you. There are people that do not care if they go to the hole. They do not care if there are people that go to a higher security prison because unfortunately for some prison is all they know. And they could be looking to challenge and make an example out of her. Or they may feel if she's a repeat offender, so to speak, she needs to be held accountable and be called out. So while these instructions may seem basic to some, for many, they fall victim to this bathroom etiquette. They don't understand the unwritten rules and in so doing make matters worse for themselves. One thing Elizabeth Holmes will become very friendly with is what's called the call-out sheet in federal prison. I would encourage you to think of the call-out sheet like an appointment book. Staff members will schedule people to participate in activities every single day, especially someone really as they're getting going in their, their, their prison term. This call-out or call-out sheet or appointment book will tell someone if they have to go to health services, education, psychology, another area. Some prisoners' job will include literally just putting the call-out sheet on the wall. There are consequences if you're on the call-out sheet and you don't show up for an appointment. That happened to me one time while running the track. I had my headphones on. Uh, this guard continued to pronounce my name so incorrectly that nobody even understood that he was trying to say my name. And because I didn't hear it, they threatened to close the compound because I didn't, I didn't hear it. They thought that I had escaped. My mistake, I didn't check the call out sheet telling me that I had an appointment to do something useless within the institution. Uh, she needs to check that sheet every single day. If not, there can be disciplinary infractions like loss of telephone privileges, commissary privileges, visiting, and other things that accompany making bad decisions. I want to transition to what's called admissions and, and orientation. And this actually gets people in a lot of trouble. When Elizabeth Holmes surrenders, she's going to be required in the early weeks to sit in a room with other prisoners and listen to staff talk about how great they are and the programs and their role within the institution. Admittedly, most staff isn't interested. I can assure you the prisoners are not interested, at least most aren't. But you have to get through it if you're going to get cleared to work. And you have to clear you have to clear a and What's interesting is, and I saw this while I was in prison, it happens a lot because some prisoners want to be helpful. That's just their style. They don't see problems associating with staff because they don't understand the rules of imprisonment. Now, I'm not saying you should never speak to staff. If they open the door and say, thank you, you're going to have a, a team meeting with a case manager where you're supposed to tell that team, supposed to tell that case manager what you do all day, how you're productive, how you're preparing to go home, you know, why you're worthy of, of, of additional halfway house time or leniency. You want to sell why you're you're worthy of it. So there are times you should speak with staff, but they're not your friends. They're paid to warehouse you, to, to confine you. And it's incredibly off-putting if you're speaking to staff, because if you do, and 45 minutes later, someone's locker is getting searched, you know what that prisoner may say? Wasn't Elizabeth Holmes talking to that guard over there? And suddenly my locker's getting searched. We have a problem. When I saw those sorts of things in prison, as articulated, for example, in chapter 21 of Lessons from Prison, a prisoner went to his bunk and saw feces and urine in his sheets. Kind of a tough way to sleep with feces and urine, in my opinion. For that reason, at the end of the ANO, staff may say, you know, any questions? Anybody, any, anybody have anything to offer? Uh, when that comes, she should keep her mouth shut. 
or simply saying no. But some prisoners say, yes, I have a question. How can I be helpful? What can I do? And so on. It typically goes bad. A and O should be much ado about nothing, though in some cases people begin to make matters worse for themselves. In a video I, I filmed, Elizabeth Holmes, Jobs in Federal Prison, I get extensively into jobs. To respect your time, I won't do so here, but I will quickly go through some of the job opportunities that exist for Elizabeth Holmes in prison. There's food service, orderlies, maintenance, landscaping, factory, commissary, education, clerical. You can imagine some of the really coveted jobs are going to be in education. Commissary pays more. Some people really dig the landscaping because they're, they're outdoors. Orderly can be a good and bad job. Like orderly is a great job if your job is to empty the trash. It's a terrible job if you're scrubbing toilets and showers. That's a terrible orderly job. What I encourage all prisoners to do is once you surrender, once she surrenders, you don't get a job till you're cleared through a &L. She should be proactive during that time and look for work that interests her. Education would be a great job. Now, I know we've had more than a million views in our collective uh, homes series, more than like 3,000 comments, I believe. And many of you have said she has no value to offer. She's a charlatan. She's a fraud. She's a crook. She's a thief. She's a criminal. She has nothing to teach anyone. I disagree. I think she has some business skills, some savvy, and ability to sell. At one point, a work ethic and a desire. She could be of value to people in prison. As many of you may dislike this video or call me crazy, she did some things good, though we all know she went rogue and went dark and ended up in a really bad spot. After all, she'll be on the wrong side of prison boundaries. She should pursue a job in education. What I would encourage her to do is assess, does she want a job just to stay busy, right? There are people who don't need to make money in prison because you only make 15 cents an hour. That's what she'll make. There are people who don't need the money, but will work for 10 hours just to stay busy, to feel like they are not in prison. I would encourage all prisoners to do their job because there will be women who go up to Elizabeth Holmes and say for a book or of stamps or two, I will do your job. She should do it. I would encourage her to find a job like I have that's an hour or two a day where you're doing your job, you're fulfilling your obligation, you're contributing to your community of felons, but the rest of the time is spent on Justin time, on Elizabeth time. And that's what's upsetting to some people because you're working hard and you're warehousing us in the minimum security camp and you're allowing us to blog and to write books and, and to get fitter. Not everyone's productive. Some people are in the, the, uh, the TV room all day watching the Kardashians. They rule that TV room like it's their fiefdom. Not everyone seizes the opportunity as I did, as I hope she does for the sake of her family and her victims who hope she pays back someday, right? She should find a job that takes a minimum amount of time. Then she's got Elizabeth time. What could that mean? Exercising for two, three hours a day, writing her novel, trying to debunk all of the misperceptions people may have about her writing letters, calling home. She'll have access to email all day at five cents an hour. Good old snail mail. Visitation is uh, suspended right now due to COVID, but at some point it will pick up. She will have so much time to work and to think and to grow. It is troubling to some people, many of whom become jealous. In fact, when people visited me at times in federal prison, some of my friends were like, dude, I love you. I miss you, but I'm kind of jealous. I could use like six or seven months here. You look fantastic. I need a break. I need a little sabbatical like you. It's still prison after all. It's not a country club. I just chose to make the most of it. I hope she makes the most of it. Continuing on commissary. Now, this can be a problem for some people. In prison, you have $360 a month to spend just in the commissary. And to your benefit, I actually created a little worksheet down here so you can see what some things cost in prison. I really went all out for you. I hope you're finding value in this video. Thank you again for your time. $360 a month in the commissary. This is what some prisoners who have money do. A couple of things. One, they find a way to have money go to other prisoners' books so they can spend like $1,000 in the commissary because 360 ain't enough. I would encourage her to not have money go to other inmates' books, though. People do it every, every single day. Staff knows some things they, they turn away from. They know it's very common. I'd encourage her not to do that. I'd also encourage her not to spend $360 or some prisons break it up where you can only do $180. I'd encourage her not to spend the whole thing at once because it's kind of off-putting to like staff. Forget staff actually, to other prisoners. It'd be like, hey, I have six bags of food here. Can you help me carry it upstairs to, to my locker inside of my cubicle? While some prisoners are thinking, I got like $40 a month coming in. This is crazy. I'm jealous of this woman. People will resent her for that. So it requires like not giving into temptation, resisting some things, not showing off, being humble, being kind. Now to the commissary list that I created just for you, some things that cost money in there. Headphones are 34 bucks. Iron Man watches 35 bucks. 
Book Light, $13. That was cool. Tuna, very popular in prison, as is uh, mackerel. People will use the mackerel or tuna to trade for services. For example, Elizabeth Holmes in federal prison will have the opportunity to pay someone to do her laundry, to cook her some food. You're going to find that staff turns the other way from some disciplinary infractions. For example, some long-term prisoners who have no money coming in will cook and clean and do laundry as a way to have, have money to shop in the commissary. Staff is well aware of that. There are things they will allow, but they will not allow using iPhones, going to another dorm without permission, not doing your job. So I would tell Elizabeth Holmes, if you are going to engage in the hustle, make sure you understand your environment and you understand the consequences of everything you think, say, and do because there are repercussions. Last little tidbit on commissary. It ain't always going to be perfect. Some items are going to be missing. <laughs> Some items are going to be missing. And it's best not to complain about it. Now, if you've dropped $80 on shoes or $50 on a Walkman or watch, you, of course, you want to have that. But there were times I ordered six tunas and five came out. And I'm like, it's all good. Not a big deal. In the totality of my life, it doesn't mean anything. I share that because some prisoners get the food and they like inspect it. I remember one prisoner, like the avocados and tomato came out and he was like holding the avocado. He's like, is this, is this fresh? Like, what, what, when was this delivered? I thought this came in yesterday. This looks like it's been here like a week. And everyone's like, are you kidding me? Get out. We want our food now. Nobody cares about your tomato or avocado. The point is you may get some bad tomatoes or avocados, Alyssa. Uh, Alyssa, that's my daughter's name. Elizabeth, move on. It's fine. Just keep moving. Do not make a show. Lay low. The goal is to be forgotten. The goal is to be totally off the grid. You don't want to be front and center uh, in front of staff. I cannot stress that enough. As I wrap up this video on what her life will be like in federal prison, I'll make clear there are days in, in prison, as easy as it may be for, for some, where you feel like it will never end. You are literally just some days watching calendar pages turn or waiting for one minute on the clock to turn to the next or watching paint dry. It can be very um, uh, down and humbling. And when you have so much time alone, it's easy to get lost in thought. And I hope when Elizabeth Holmes gets lost in thought, she gives thought, real thought, to how she ended up in this predicament, what she'll do to make it through, what is success for her in the coming weeks, months, and years, and she can then reverse engineer a plan. I released from prison much differently than when I entered. I entered as a 33-year-old um, entitled, privileged kid who had all the breaks in life, who had never endured any sense of adversity, who, when I got into trouble, uh, blamed, blamed other people. And those choices, I took advantage of people and I deserved to go to federal prison. And while there, at times I didn't think I could get through it, uh, but I did. And I'm grateful through work and a lot of help, I emerged differently than when I went in. I hope Elizabeth Holmes emerges differently than when she went in. I hope she emerges differently than how she is right now blaming and excusing others because at the end of this regardless of how you may feel about victims and i know many people could care less about the victims because they're so rich i do care because they were lied to and they lost money regardless of how rich they are i'm not a fan of victim shaming i hope for their sake she can make amends i hope for their sake she can prove worthy of a second chance and i hope for the sake of her family she works incredibly hard and she doesn't let this experience define the rest of her life it is 10.56 p.m. on Friday, April 22nd. I started today a little after 4.30 in the morning. And I, uh, in the epilogue of Lessons from Prison, I, uh, my partner and I wrote, if you say you're going to do something, you do it. And I wrote earlier today that I was going to film this video. And I filmed this video, even though I'm starting to get a little bit of tired. I did a lot of talking today. And I am definitely rambling. I am definitely going on. I got to wrap it up, man. And I'm going to do that now. Thank you for watching this video. I'm very grateful for your attention and time. I look forward to returning soon. Bye-bye.